Hello, and welcome back to my reviews of Doctor Who Flux, this time with a special edition Doctor Who Day episode. Yep, today is November 23rd, Doctor Who's birthday. It is now 58 years old today. Uh, I did not have a Doctor Who Day themed upload uh, ready to go for today. As you've probably already gathered, the remastered video essay is not coming out today. I haven't officially confirmed that it was not coming out today, so I imagine a small portion of you may have been like, what about today? No, it's, it's not coming today. I got a lot still to do. I have to review Flux, make the whole encyclopedia complete, and then it'll come out on Christmas Day. So officially, as of Doctor Who Day, Christmas Day is still the day. Uh, also, on a side note, I had a, a tribute video on the 50th of the show, you know, the Time War and all that stuff from Day of the Doctor, that I was going to try to get out today. It took a lot longer than expected. I doubt it will come out today, but in the next like week or so, if I get all of my problems sorted out with it, you can expect that uh, in your sub boxes. <laughs> I am very quickly going to get very hot in this bathrobe that I decided would be funny to wear for this uh, review of Doctor Who Flux. Uh, but yeah, we got episode four, Village of the Angels. This is the Weeping Angels solo story of Doctor Who Flux, the first one we've had since the Angels Take Manhattan in 2012. We've seen them in cameos in The God Complex and uh, Time of the Doctor. Uh, what else? Um, Hellbent. They were also in Hellbent. Probably a few others. So uh, this is our first Weeping Angel solo story in almost a decade, which is crazy. Uh, so uh, this is Chris Chibnall and co-writer Maxine Alderton's take on the Weeping Angels. We had some uh, good ideas in this one, some you know recurring themes from what Stephen Moffat has established on the Weeping Angels canon. And uh, some other new additions that I'm going to talk about throughout the episode. I will, as I always do, go through every single thing that happened in the episode, describe it, what I liked, what I didn't, and I also, same as Once Upon a Time, I have done a reaction to this one. I'm deciding to do all of these digitally now, so we can have my initial reaction to the episode that I cite whenever I need to throughout the episode, and then this initial conclusive review uh, now that I've seen the whole episode and have a whole picture of the entire thing. These are very long videos, so I... I'm really trying to uh, make it worth your while with these uh, with these giant videos. Uh, and also, I guess since we're this is Doctor Who Day, I'm not gonna have an opportunity to show this again. This is kind of what I've been working on on the side. This is David Tennant from the End of Time. Uh, I still this is too yellow. This all needs to be a lighter yellow, basically. But yeah, this is End of Time, David Tennant. Uh, the light is very unforgiving to the paint job. It looks real nice. Uh, it took forever to get the face down, but yeah, there he is, my boy. Uh, coming from Once Upon a Time, if we recall, that episode was very nuts and convoluted, but uh, had some major positives going for it, in my opinion. Big one is the dialogue and this whole Bell and Vendor dynamic at the end, the seeds of which in this story were not planted very well, but in its resolution, I think it's one of the better dynamics out of the entirety of Chris Chibnall's run and had a surprising amount of heart and... Uh, and uh, finesse to the writing. So uh, writing across the board was much better in that episode, but the plot and all the fabrications of the story to make this whole dream sequence past exposition uh, setup of these characters happen was dumb, and all those elements surrounding that was dumb, but the dialogue, main thing that was good. So uh, in that episode, we had our cliffhanger where a weeping angel comes out of Yaz's phone, and then it hijacks the TARDIS, and then we get a big rock and cliffhanger into episode four village of the angels are we being angel solo story which is starting right now all right the first shot of the cold open is a tape recorder and and i believe what is called an eeg i had to look it up uh it's just those cool they always use it in fucking movies where it's this thing that you hook up to your brain and then it had the pens go back and forth and do some waveforms. Uh, it's that machine. We see the waveforms. Uh, and then we see uh, Claire and a new character, uh, an older gentleman. This is Claire from episode one. If you'll remember, she was the person that got got by the weeping angel in the middle of the street. And that whole weird scene from episode one. Claire Brown. Yeah, that's her. But in this scene, we see Claire. And she's giving some uh, expository dialogue of her name and the fact that this is a continuation from... Uh, episode one, where she got got by the Weeping Angel. She has been displaced in time back to the 60s. We are in 1967, as Claire states for us, and and she's hooked up to this whole waveform EEG thing. And this guy is the scientist, uh, you know, interrogating her and reading her brain waves. Oh, <laughs> I forgot you're very with it. Hmm. Chibnall does old timey dialogue very well. Uh, 
and we also see some establishing stuff of the rest of the scene, you know, this whole village area. Uh, we see some people walking around at night. I believe that's when we see them. Uh, they're shouting for a person. They're looking for someone. We don't know who, naturally, at the beginning. Uh, we see a dude walk around with this little note on the ground that says, leave now. He picks it up. And that was a thread that we're getting starting right off of the cold open. So that's good, I guess. Uh, we see Claire again. We continue with the scene where this guy is interrogating her. He's finding it very hard to believe that she was born in the future and that she's been displaced in time by the Weeping Angel that we saw in episode one. Uh, and then we get some whole little spikes on the waveforms and Claire starts convulsing. And then she raises up out of her seat. We get a nice little shot where she comes into frame from the bottom and then she starts speaking. Uh, she's basically like possessed by a Weeping Angel or something. Uh, and then we get the title theme. The angel has the TARDIS. Uh, after that, we are back where the cliffhanger of episode three ended. We're in the TARDIS, and the angels have the TARDIS. They're in control of the council. Uh, the Doctor, Yaz, and Dan are pinned up against the front door of the TARDIS. They can't leave because it's in flight, or the you know the angels are in control of it. We are to gather, and then uh, Jodie Whittaker goes to either side of the doors and pulls out these two coils, these blue coils, and she says she's going to reboot the TARDIS, and that will get the angels out of it somehow and this is of course a new invention of chris's to the tardis where situated next and this has to be remembered in the next episodes situated next to the door are two blue cables and if you put them together the tardis reboots and any potential invaders are expelled instantly uh so i will be keeping a mental note of that in the future so the angel comes to the screen it's a big scary moment where all the people hide behind the sofa and then she puts the cords together, she tells them all to blink, and everything's fine. Okay. Reboot the TARDIS. It works. Of course it worked! Okay. New invention of Chipmunks for TARDIS. And then following that, we have some expository dialogue written by my uh, friend and hero, Chris Chibnall, who made the uh, bold move to tell Maxine, no, I'll write this line, and uh, give us this very forced expository dialogue that he pollutes all the scripts with. Other only problem is, we don't know where we are, or even if we are. And the third only problem this is... This one is written by Chris Chibnall. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We're only, like, what, three minutes into the episode? Thank you. So yeah, the angels have teleported us to the 60s, obviously, where this episode takes place. We don't know why. We're supposed to try to figure out why, but we're here in this creepy village at night where there's angels roaming around, and there's a ton of them. And uh, we come out the TARDIS doors, and we see uh, two new characters, which is you know, fine. We have a whole village of supporting uh, characters that we're going to have to follow. And he is uh, at the police box in the handles and has the phone, the dummy phone that the doctor has that does not work, and he's trying to use it. And I thought that was kind of clever, because this is the 60s, after all. This is when police boxes were all over the place. And, you know, the doctor and company come out, and he gets startled. And it's, it's a great little scene. I quite liked it. Hello? Yes? Chimney Christmas. Gerald <laughs> Langway. Uh, Chris Chibnall has a very good tendency to write his, uh, his uh, old-timey characters very well. He's done that with Liverpool Man. Oh, also, he is not in this episode at all. I forgot to say that. Which is so sad. Our streak is broken. Liverpool Man is not in one scene in every episode as of episode four. Man. I can't believe that. It would have been so easy to just put him in for a scene. God damn it, Chris Chibnall. Anyway, he does his old-timey characters pretty well, and uh, yeah, that that persists for this episode to a pretty high caliber. I think most of the supporting cast, in fact, all of them are written very well, except for the ones that aren't really developed, but the dialogue is convincing and, you know, realistic. But yeah, they clamber out of the TARDIS, and they uh, start interrogating these people until Jodie Whittaker pulls out her sonic screwdriver, which has gotten hot from something, so she... It is following a signal, and then the doctor just kind of leaves and tells Yaz and Dan to take care of this whole interrogation scene between these two characters. So she dashes off into the woods to follow this uh, energy signal from her sonic screwdriver. And we get left with Yaz and Dan, who conduct this little uh, interview, uh, establishing what this episode's plot is going to be. Tell us everything. We're missing <laughs> a little girl. Tell us everything. So we cut back to Claire and this new guy that we don't know the name of yet in their little dungeon of science in this village in the 60s. And then all of a sudden, the doctor jumps down the steps in a big 
surprising moment. Uh, and Maxine Alderton shows off how much better of a writer she is than Chris Chibnall by giving us a nice, big, exciting uh, exchange where the Doctor is very snappy. You know, she's doing her, she's doing her Doctor introduction-ness where she throws out her psychic paper and then she does a funny little uh, response to that and we get some nice little introductions to these characters. I felt it was very good and Chris Chibnall definitely didn't write this. Looks like it. Interesting. How did you get in here? The door was open. It most certainly Go writer. Was not. Definitely. Was once I opened it, but let's not get bombed. If he did, I would be very surprised. Uh, but the doctor introduces herself to all these characters. We find out that this new guy, this new old guy, the scientist, uh, his name is. Oh God, I think it's it's something. Uh, play the clip. I I can't remember what it is. Professor Jericho, Eustatius Jericho. But his last name is Jericho, and I'll be referring to him as Jericho throughout the rest of this episode. But we love Jericho. He was awesome, and he gets some he gets some nice moments later in the episode. But right now, he's just an old scientist that uh, is oblivious to all this sci-fi stuff going on around. You know, the Weeping Angels and stuff. Uh, we see that uh, Claire is here, and Claire and the Doctor meet. Uh, we are finally uh, given an answer as to that, yes, this does happen after episode one. Uh, this is the Claire from episode one after she got uh, teleported by the Weeping Angel to here, and she has been here for some time as we later figure out. So we have to ask, why was the Weeping Angel there in episode one? We can only guess as to why that was, but, you know, I'm assuming we'll maybe get that established later. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but Claire leaves the scene, I think right here, she just says that she needs to use the restroom or something, and uh, she leaves and goes up out of the basement, and the Doctor and Jericho are having a nice little exchange, uh, we see some stuff around the room, we see that there is uh, some drawings on the table, of these are drawings that Claire has done, because she has some weird mind stuff going on that uh, gets explained later, probably. But we see a TARDIS drawing, among other things, we also see a drawing of an angel, and the doctor abruptly grabs it and tries to rip it up and throw it in the fire. At which point I went, oh yeah, an image of an angel becomes an angel. I forgot about that shit from Time of the Angels. Uh, so I took note, very good job, Chris, for remembering that and following through with that. In the Weeping Angels canon, I was very excited to see that. Uh, but Jodie Whittaker rips up this angel picture, throws it into the uh, fireplace. It does not get immediately destroyed there. But uh, at the time, we, we gather that, yeah, that's probably... That's probably taken care of. We're just establishing that. Yes, we are following the rules from Time of the Angels and Flesh and Stone, unlike Stephen Moffat did in The Angels Take Manhattan. What are you doing? Ah, uh, image oh. of an angel. Cool. Trying to keep you safe. Stay here. He's he's being consistent. I like this. So it was good to see that. I'm not sure if Chris wrote that or Maxine did, but these two had a very good depiction of their weeping angels that uh obviously follows from their previous episodes. Uh, and then shortly after that, we cut to Claire in the bathroom. We get an honestly nice shot where she's in the mirror. I think this whole little shot was surprisingly picturesque, but it looks nice. And, you know, she's washing her face in the mirror. We can immediately gather from seeing this that this is going to be some weird... We're going to see something twisted in the mirror. Uh, so after some very slow washing of her face, we get the reveal that she has weeping angel wings in the mirror. Oh, and this is, uh, we later find out that this is a hallucination, but, uh, we don't know what that means, initially seeing it, but she has weeping angel wings in the mirror, uh, so we're asking questions throughout the episode as to what the hell that means, and, uh, how it's going to be explained. Uh, after that, we're back with the establishing characters of this village. We have, uh, you know, this younger guy with a cool little hat and some glasses, uh, and he's checking, he's counting all the gravestones, uh, because in a previous scene, uh, an older lady who is established to have left this note that says leave now uh, knows that the Weaving Angels are here and that people need to leave or they'll die. Uh, and she says that there are, or he says that there are 92 gravestones in this graveyard. And uh, she says, we'll count them. And if it's more, then you'll know that I'm telling the truth. So he's counting all the gravestones. Uh, he goes down, he's counting 91, 92, and then he says 93. And then we see a Weeping Angel, our first well, not our first one but like it's a big moment where we see the sweeping angel in the graveyard and uh he walks up to it and doesn't understand why it's there and then he get, he blinks and he, he's gone so that guy existed to die he was 
he was uh he was he was nice i guess wow he's just dead okay uh but he's gone and we cut to this older lady who was in the previous scene uh looking at where he died so we have to ask if she was looking at the angel, how the hell did he get zapped back in time? Unless touching an angel now is the way that you get caught, not blinking near them, and then they grab you. If you grab them, totally fine, but if they grab you, you're gone. But now, you touch it, you're gone. So That's probably what happened there, but it was a weird scene. It, it, it felt really weird. You know, you have to think of scenes for, like uh, Octavian's death from Flesh and Stone, where he's in a chokehold from an angel and he has to and the doctor has to leave before the angel can kill him uh granted the angels were a little bit different in flesh and stone but it was a weird scene you know it was cut weirdly uh it played out super weird but yeah that guy's gone we cut to yaz and dan in company with these uh this older couple who we figure out they're looking for a little girl uh who is as we can probably assume has been gotten by a weeping angel so everyone's looking for her uh, and they're doing a little manhunt here, looking for her. They got flashlights, they're running across the field. Uh, we have some dialogue between these elderly bunch where uh, we figure out that this older guy is not very nice to the 10-year-old niece that he has that they are looking for. And uh, Dan thinks that maybe she ran away because she doesn't like this guy, uh, which does get affirmed later in the episode. So we have one of those nice little abuse themes, I guess. Uh, but that elderly couple leave to... Uh, join the manhunt and Yaz and Dan go off on their own to search in a new area that people hadn't searched yet uh, and then we have a scene where a weeping angel shows up that uh, you know it tries to be a tense scene I personally don't think it was tense scenes do exist later in the episode well tense I'm not really scared of the weeping angels anymore but you know I, I, what I could imagine to be tense to a kid seeing the weeping angels but this scene I didn't think was very tense at all it's just the weeping angel emerges, they try to back walk away from it, and then Dan trips on Yaz. They both blink, the angel gets really close to them, the light from their torch goes out, and then Dan very sillily bonks the flashlight to try to turn the light on, and then when it comes on, they blind themselves, and the angel gets them. So that was our first little action scene with the angels. Not a very good start, but it does improve later in the episode, so... It's important to note that, but yes, Dan and Yaz do get caught here. They get displaced in time, and we will be following them in a different time period later. And then, in a very surprising cut, we see Belle for the first time since, you know, episode 3. I wasn't expecting to see her in this Weeping Angel solo story, but you know, I guess I had some, some reason to expect her. But yeah, she's here, and she has her own little little plot going on. My universe. <gasps> it's Belle! Uh, she's landing on this... Uh, planet i don't remember what it's called uh but it's basically like the last little sanctuary at the end of the universe after the flux uh where a bunch of people are kind of camping out uh, so she lands here we get a new character uh who talks about what has happened since the flux and what's going on what this place is so it's just a, an introductory scene with this new guy i think he was okay but you know he is a new character after all just got here uh, oh, God damn it. Hello. And while he does share scenes with Belle in this whole thing, I don't think he was really necessary, but, you know, it's fine, I guess. Uh, but then we cut away, and we're back with the Doctor in this in this house with, uh, with Claire and Jericho. Uh, we have a scene where uh, I think the Doctor is just talking about the Weeping Angels to Jericho. I, th I, I think I can't really remember. Did I not tell you to stay downstairs? This is my house! Uh, but then following an exchange between these two, uh, Jericho goes to open his front door to his little house, and then we have a cool shot of all the angels out there standing in front of his front door, uh, which is promptly ruined by an amazing line that was 100% written by Chris Chibnall, where he tries to write confusion. How did they get here? <laughs> Away, Not alarmed by moving statues, bro. Keep your eyes on them. Thank you, Chris. Should have given break. that one to Maxine. So yeah, we have the Weeping Angels assaulting this little little house, this little mansion here. Uh, they're going up into the windows. The, all the characters barricade the doors. Uh, we have to ask if, you know, angels can <laughs> turn valves on doors that are magnetized. 
uh, why don't they just rip through these doors? And they do rip through the back one eventually, but it takes them some time, so... Uh, I guess a tiny bit of inconsistency in how strong the angels are, but it's not really a big deal. But yeah, the angels are attacking the house, and these characters are trying to work through this whole pickle that they're in. We see Claire, and then we have some establishing dialogue of the fact that she is... Again, we're establishing that these two have met since episode one. This is following that... She has been in the 60s for two years, and she's been getting premonitions of the angels and the stuff that's going on there. Uh, and then we also find out after that that this person actually is the whole Amy Pond thing going on, where she has an angel in her eye. She looked into the eyes of an angel, the angel's now inside her, and we are going to gather that she is some sort of like double agent for the angels, or that she's just gonna die, and we need to take care of that. Oh, she looked into the eyes. I remember that. Good job, Chris. But in a tizzy following that, we have the Doctor and Jericho having a conversation where the Doctor tells him to grab a television from upstairs and then get it down to the basement. Uh, we are going to assume that this is some sort of setup into the resolution of the episode. Uh, at least at the time, I thought that that was what that was. Uh, but he goes and he grabs an old-timey TV, which is very vintage and, uh, you know, appropriate. And uh, we cut away to uh, Yaz and Dan, even further in the past, since getting got by the Weeping Angels. Uh, they're looking around this village. They can assume that, uh, what is her name, Peggy, from, you know, the 60s, who has been got by the Weeping Angel, the little girl, uh, that she is around here somewhere, since she has been, you know, assumed to have gotten captured by the Weeping Angels. So they're looking around these houses we go into a house where there are chickens on the table which was very fun because they're chickens who doesn't love chickens uh, and then the brave soldier john bishop uh puts his hand next to the chickens to pick up a little teacup and then set it down after a few seconds but uh, you know applause to john bishop for being a brave soldier and putting his hand next to those dreaded uh fearful chickens uh, but we have some Yaz and Dan dialogue to move this scene forward. Dan has a real sad moment where he asks Yaz if they're going to be able to get home and how they're going to do that, which would have been sad if <laughs> if time and time again in Chibnall's run we're, we're trapped somewhere where it, it seems like there's no escape, yet we magically get back to the present day through nonsense. I think of something like Spyfall immediately where the doctor and uh you know yaz uh, get trapped in this void place and then they get out by getting attacked by these weird ethereal creatures not much of stakes when it comes to uh, people getting trapped somewhere uh, but yeah we have that and then following that from the back we see peggy the little girl finally entering the plot she is not dead uh, we have found her and she's she comes into the scene uh, she eats bread in a very strange scene where the Yaz and Dan are interrogating her as to what happened in this village where everyone is, as if they don't already know that it was the Weeping Angels. Peggy embellishes her answers for no reason and continues to eat bread before uh, taking Yaz and Dan to see the edge of the world in what is described as a quantum extraction, I believe is the name where uh, basically this whole village is suspended in time, where we, we go to the edge of this village's perimeter and we see space. And that this is basically where the world cuts off, which is very strange, and we can only guess what the hell that's supposed to mean. Uh, and then in the cool transition, we're back in the 60s with this elderly couple uh, looking for Peggy, where they see the end of the world in this whole quantum extraction, uh, and they question as to what the hell that is and why it's happening and then we see a weeping angel behind them and the uh the elderly gentleman as a boneheaded as he continues to be in his characterization goes up and tries to move the angel because he assumes that someone went and put it there to scare them and uh he grabs the angel and immediately gets displaced in time so we can assume that that is the rules now if you touch an angel you're done so you cannot touch them anymore you have if you touch them you're gone That's like those memes where people scream and disappear. 
it's weird because with this episode i think there's the least amount of serialization i think this is the most episodic of all of them except for the things with bell this is pretty much a opening closed weeping angel story and uh you know there's not a lot for me to say that in terms of critiquing it i suppose like right here i can say dialogue is consistent i think you can very clearly tell when chris chibnall is taking over the script for a scene and you can very clearly tell when the good writing by maxine is incorporated into the script i think dialogue for all these 60 characters is written very well uh i think the angels are fine in their depiction i think most of, i think this is just like i don't have a ton of wrong with this one until the end when we get some of the serialization incorporated into this one i think of the back half i think the setup of you know this is a village there are angels here they're attacking the house there's fine enough dialogue and there's fine enough stakes in it um you know i don't really love this whole searching for peggy thing going on i don't think there's a ton in me that cares about that right now i'm trying to be particularly fair to this one i don't want to just say oh this is dumb when you know there's obviously it was written for a reason and that reason is shown later um yeah i guess i could i think as of right now this is probably the best i hesitate to say the best chibnall story i think haunting of Diodati is the best chibnall story across the board because it is not written by chris chibnall at all the guest writer that they got for that one just had such a great vision for the episode characters were written so insanely well and it had a great atmosphere to it i think uh, ashad was written very well in that one so i think across the board if you were to pick the best one it is 100 percent haunting a villa diodati it doesn't come even close but one that isn't haunting a villa i don't know i guess it would be this one i'm i I think I might be biased because I have a soft spot for the angels and I like that there are new ideas incorporated into this one and we're following what has already been established by the Weeby Angels from the Stephen Moffat ones before. I think there are maybe some elements that didn't really matter but that is like a far cry from negative criticism when it comes to Chibnall where we've had some really dumb stuff <laughs> just sink so many potentially good episodes. So I think this is probably, in my opinion, the best episode of Chibnall's run that is not The Haunting of Villa Diodati. Uh, maybe Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, maybe Praxius, but of Flux so far, it's probably this one, just because it has the least amount of just bonkers ideas, bonkers setup, pointless characters, insane contrivance, inconsistent dialogue. Almost none of that is in this episode, I think. It does what it does. It does it well. Better than Once Upon Time. Uh, I think so far, this is easily the best. You know, there is some dumb stuff later that I can, you know, I can suspend my disbelief just a tiny bit when it comes to that stuff when we do get it later. Because, you know, Stephen Moffat has done some very dumb stuff with the Angels in his past episodes. And I gave it a pass, so I think it would be fair enough to just give this one a pass when it comes to that. Uh, but yeah, back to the episode. Uh, we're with the doctor in the basement where we actually get a very, very good scene where we get some setup as to that this is their little base that they're going to fortify. Uh, and we get some image of an angel stuff going on where we, we have this TV. This TV is basically set up as a security camera to watch the upstairs. Uh, but we do know that the angels are going to come out of the TV if you let them because an image of an angel becomes an angel. So uh, the doctor tells uh, Jericho to just kind of watch that screen. Don't let him move. Uh, and he is doing that. Uh, we also see that drawing from the beginning float out of the furnace, and then psh, an angel comes out of the drawing. And in a very cool little scene, uh, Jodie Whittaker crumples up the paper, tries to set it on fire. Uh, that does not work. We instead get a flaming weeping angel, and then she dumps like a bucket of ashes on it, and then it goes away. Uh, but yeah, this whole this whole little scene had some good ideas that I was excited to see. I think it was fairly tense, I guess. Uh, most tense the angels have been in this episode. <laughs> in. Made it worse. Uh, and then we finally get the formal reveal that Claire did look into the eyes of an angel. She has an angel inside her. We see that her hands are all stone. Uh, which we learn in Time of the Angels and Flesh and Stone that that was hallucination. So I'm wondering if that's what it is here. 
didn't really appear to be that. Um, but then we finally get the first of Chris Chibnall's very dumb ideas with the angels, where in order to save Claire from having the angel in her mind, the doctor goes into her mind through, you know, like a psychic link and has like a mind battle with the angels. Instead of what the solution was in Flesh and Stone to just have Claire close her eyes. I'm not sure why the doctor forgot about that from Flesh and Stone. I don't know why this is the way that we decided we were going to solve that. Uh, that's what we're getting in this scene. And, uh, yeah, we cut away. So we get this whole angel-doctor mind battle inside Clara's mind where the angel is once again given a voice, the second time since Angel Bob from Time of the Angels from Flesh and Stone, which was an exception, let it be clear. So we have this angel having a voice thing. Uh, I do agree with, who was it, Harbo Wombs and his little video on the Weeping Angels that the angels should not be given a voice because they do not need it. It Giving the angels an agenda is dumb because it, it makes them less scary. And, you know, the whole idea is that they're mysterious, deadly assassins that just kind of wander the universe, crop up somewhere, and, you know, kill people. They pick off people and feed off their residual energy from the days that they never had. So the number one thing that I was terrified of going into this one is, especially seeing this, the angels given an agenda. And that is exactly what happens. But why? They are an extraction squad. Oh, for the division. God. See? No. Okay. He did it. He gave the Weeping Angels an agenda. God damn it. What a dumb idea. Uh, so, yeah, the angels are given an agenda. Not just that. It turns out that there are teams of angels that work for the division. So the angels have jobs, and they work for people, which makes no fucking sense. Because they don't have a voice. How do they even create alliances? They don't speak. Oh my god. Well, I guess they do speak in Chris Chibnall's universe, because uh, we get a little scene later where the angel just kind of talks. Uh, but before we get to that, we have a little intermediate scene with Belle. Back with Belle and this random dude that I don't even think was given a name. So we're back with Belle on this little, 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 I don't know, dead planet where there's a whole community going on. And there's a bunch of people uh, conglomerating around this big tower thing. And, uh, you know, there's some lines about how this is the last salvation of something. And then we see Azure kind of teleport in here and give a speech to people uh, through their mind. Yeah. Space is disintegrating. It's Voldemort. Time is uh, but she's talking about how there's an unharmed universe that she is transporting people to. She's basically posing as a god to these people. Obviously, we know that she is a big bad guy and that she just wants to kill all these people. They don't know that, so they're all n unaware that this is going to result in their deaths. Belle does know that, so she... Uh, basically gets this other guy, this supporting guy from earlier. Uh, he says, no, don't get in the teleport thing. So Azir is going to teleport all these people to this new this new universe that is unharmed and all brand new. Uh, so Belle and this new guy uh, just kind of dash off and barely dodge the teleport. And then all this, this huge crowd of hundreds of people get teleported to where we later figure out is basically a prison. And Belle knows this because she's just, like, a scavenger, a survivor of the Flux. So yeah, Azir leaves after that, and Belle has an exchange with this guy saying that that was not, that wasn't going to save you, that was a prison, and this guy is mad because he wanted to be saved, and he dashes off, and Belle's on her own. Uh, we come back to Yaz and Dan with Peggy in 1901, and we see uh, the, the elderly couple who have been displaced in time from the last time that we saw them. They come in and continue to be stupid when Yaz, Dan, and Peggy tell them, don't go in front of the angel, the angel that grabbed them and displaced them in time. This was a really dumb scene thinking about it since they just got attacked by an angel. They fucking walk right past it, and then the angel grabs his coat, and then he turns around and decides to grab the angel, and then they both die. And then we get a new little line of canon where uh, basically... No one survives it twice. If you get grabbed by an angel a second time, you just crumble into stone. And I'll let my reaction play. But that's... 
I'm so sorry, Becky. That's not how it works. They feed off your time. You have to That's live. So yeah, those guys get grabbed by the angel, they crumble to pieces, and I'm pretty sure we cut away right then to uh, the Doctor and Claire and Jericho in the basement where the angels are coming to get them. Uh, and this is a... I'm pretty sure this is just the one scene with Jericho. Uh, Claire and the Doctor are obviously in a little mind battle, and Jericho is on his own. He's just watching the TV, trying to keep the angels uh, from advancing on them, and uh, a voice starts talking to Jericho through the TV. We can assume it is the angel's voice, and uh, I called him Angel Jericho in my notes. I don't know where this voice is coming from or what it means. I guess maybe this could be set up in future episodes. Maybe Jericho dies, and they uh, reanimate his consciousness like they did with Angel Bo or Bob, I guess, to create Angel Bob. So Angel Jericho would be the explanation. I don't know if that's going to happen. We'd have to wait and see in the next episodes if that does get resolved. But as of right now, it's just a magic Jericho voice coming out of the angel that is talking to Jericho. And uh, Jericho gets a nice little... <laughs> We'll see in establishing his strength as a character. I quite like this one. I had I had a lot of fun getting into this one. Who's there? Angel Bob. You are Jericho. Angel Jericho. Listen to yourself, Jericho. Look away, Jericho. Look away. No, thank you. Yeah, that's my boy Jericho. I see you, Jericho. Says who, Jericho? Yourself. Please stop using my voice. It's a very clever trick, but most impolite without permission. So interested That's in good. working. Surrender to the angels, Jericho. Get a cool voice. Uh, so the angel is coming out of the TV. We have a nice little shot of it emerging. That's a cool shot. The effects look pretty great. Jericho smashes the TV, so now he can no longer watch the angels and stop them from advancing so they're coming down the basement steps and he sees them and he turns the corner and he has such a great line here i'll play it you stop right there you are observed mm. and that is my power over you for now boom, boom. jericho i just love that line it was so awesome uh, yeah, Jericho is great. I really enjoyed him toward the back half of this episode. Uh, so I think with these new characters, Chibnall is doing better. With the old ones, they're kind of rooted in their problems, and it's hard for Chibnall to break out of that. So I guess that's kind of the main takeaway in terms of characters. All of the new additions, Dogman, Vinder, all the, most of the supporting cast are given niches. They fill them, they fill them well. Uh, Obviously, we have some characters we haven't seen the end of their story, so I'm speaking before the next episodes make or break their characters and their arcs. So we'll, we'll see if that does get resolved. I think the new additions are just improved across the board, and Jericho, living example of that, he is such a three-dimensional character and has some really great moments of heroism and uh, yeah, and other things, of course. So yeah, the angels are coming down the steps, and they're going to kill Jericho, the Doctor, and Claire. Uh, and then we see an angel being made out of the EEG waveforms, which, having watched this one, does not factor in at all. I guess it was just kind of a cool shot that they wanted to do, where the EEGs sketch an angel. It was cool, but didn't really play into the episode at all. Uh, so we get that. We cut to the Doctor in this little mind battle, where the angel once again speaks about its motivations and how it has knowledge about the division and he's hiding from the other <laughs> government-influenced angels from the Division uh, because he is a good guy and has knowledge and they want to extract it from him or something. So weird. Such a weird thing to incorporate into the angels of all of the villains. Like, the angels are the ones that have communities and politics and, you know, rogue angels. It's so laughably dumb, in my opinion. But, you know, suspend your disbelief, and it gets better. Including you. Yeah. I hold everything. Including the memories that were taken from you. That's Guys, why I don't I like you this. Here, so yeah, we get our second scene inside this little, little void place. Uh, just establishing more of 
what the angel knows, what the doctor knows, and why we as audience members should care about this rogue angel. Uh, and then we get Jericho again, who apparently throws a cup at the doctor and Claire to break him out of their mind battle. Hey, what happened? Oh, Sorry, threw a cup at you. I needed to shake you out of it. We're running out <laughs> Jericho. of Jericho, which I thought was so absurd and kind of funny, especially since it's a throwaway line. And then we get the reveal that there's a back exit to this basement that the doctor knew about and didn't tell everyone. So, I, yeah, we get that little deus ex to get out of this basement area. We see that there's a fake wall. The doctor busts it down. They go through the door. So, yeah, this nice little crypt tunnel out into the outside. Uh, and basically, we're just getting the characters getting into that area uh, where we find out that there are angels in the walls. So they're buried in the ground in this area, apparently. So you get the, the hands coming out of the uh, tunnel walls, which was a cool visual. And we have them emerging from the dirt and the mud. Yeah? Whoa. Angels in the walls here. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. Oh, and, you know, attacking our heroes. Uh, and we end it with a Waters of Mars shot where, you know, the camera dollies in real uh, close on a specific subject. Uh, but I think it was done worse. Obviously, it's shaky and stuff whereas with the waters of mars one it was a clean phew, zoom in on tenet's face and applied into you know the energy of the scene with this one just kind of felt like an artsy shot and i don't know if i really liked it honestly and then we cut back to yaz and dan and peggy in 1901 they're in this field and we come to i don't know how to describe this it's like a <laughs> someone has cropped the uh <laughs> the image and is laying the two different footage of <laughs> this area the one that's in 1901 and the one that's in 1967 over each other basically it's just a force field where on one side it's 1901 the other side it's 1967 if you cross it you die it makes no sense if you think about it really hard just don't think about it it's basically a super duper magic portal where on one side it's 1901, the other side it's 1967. Uh, and obviously, yeah, it's Dan and Peggy are on the other side where they see 1967. Dan throws a stick and then it burns up. So we are assuming that, you know, you will die if you cross the threshold. Uh, I don't think it's anything except we see the old lady emerge and see Dan, Yaz, and Peggy. Uh, and then we get the reveal here that this old lady that we've been seeing creeping around this whole episode is an older version of Peggy. This is her in the future. She does not escape from 1901. I remember this. I remember the strange old woman. Oh. And I remember all that followed. That makes sense, honestly. I, I should have seen this coming. She stays in 1901 and gets older and then eventually ends up here. So we have a scene where they share a heart to heart uh, where it is apparently revealed that the angels are sparing Peggy because someone needs to witness the quantum extraction, which, again, we don't really know what that entails yet. So, weird stuff, I guess. And then we see uh, uh, the Doctor and Company, Jericho and Claire, in this tunnel. They're making their way through it. If one of us keeps eyes on the angel at all times, Professor... Doing that deliberately. Yes. Trying to get you to blink or sneeze. <laughs> I just did. Uh, Jericho gets a really <laughs> silly line. Jericho, man, he's so fun. He's such a fun character. I'm not blinking. <laughs> man said, I'm not blinking. And the angel believed him. I'm through. That's funny. How I got I'm not blinking. And then in a very weirdly cut scene that confused me a lot jericho gets grabbed by an angel i thought for a second the dust got in his eyes so he was had the angel in his eyes or something because of the weird shot that they did uh where you see the angel in his reflection i'm pretty sure it's just the weirdest possible way to shoot jericho getting grabbed by a weeping angel but that's what happens what the? peggy oh what just happened there right. and he gets Zorped right to where Dan, Yaz, and Peggy are standing. So he just kind of joins the scene and then goes, Where am I? What happened? Because he doesn't know anything in regards to the Weeping Angels displacing you. So uh, a bunch of stuff's happening really fast here at the end. Uh, Claire had gone first out of this little tunnel that they're on into the opening. Uh, and the doctor's making her way through that 
the little crevice, uh, but the angels are behind her, so she's looking at the angels behind her, and she's saying, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll play it. I'm ready to go out, but I can't without turning my back. And I'm quick. Uh, angels are okay. faster than you. Race, yeah. No, angels are faster than you. You're not going very fast, Jody. Oh. You're not attacking. It's the crack of time. It's they want to eat it. Remember that one time? Why am I still here? Something else is watching them. Or what are you waiting for? they're looking at each other. Very weird scene that was super tonally off the wall, and I couldn't gauge it really. Where the doctor's saying, "If I turn, you'll move," but I'm faster than you, which is factually untrue. The doc, the the angels are faster than the speed of light. Which is so dumb that she's like, I'm faster than... It doesn't make any fucking sense. That's like the most fundamental thing about the angels is that they're faster than you could possibly imagine. There's literally no way the doctor would have made it through and that that would be her line of reasoning that she's saying, I'll just run for it. Totally off the wall and doesn't make any sense. But of course we see that they're not moving because they have her surrounded already and they're just fucking with her. So she gets through the crevice, and we see all these angels surrounding her at this burial site where all the angels are buried in the soil. Uh, and then we get this uh, whole cliffhanger where we see this is exactly where this whole portal wall is, where we see the other 1901, or the Dan and Yaz and everyone else is. And then we, on the other side, we have Claire, the Doctor, and old Peggy, as well as all these angels. Uh, so everyone's cornered. The episode is coming to an end where uh, the angels say that they... Don't want the rogue angel anymore, this fucking rogue angel. They want the doctor instead because of reasons to deal with a division that we're probably going to get more answers to. If not, it's probably just because she's important, which is usually good enough for most episodes. But uh, in this whole big dramatic cliffhanger, the doctor basically turns into a weeping angel. Makes you think they're going to listen. Well, you're all they want, <laughs> and you're surrounded. <laughs> Oh god, is this the cliffhanger? <laughs> we get a big CG shot of a CG model of Jodie Whittaker meshed with a real green screen of Jodie, where uh, a bunch of stone comes up her body, her hands turn into stone, she grows angel wings, and then she turns into an angel. Uh, we end on a sort of top-down, mostly slanted, high-up angle of this whole scene with the doctor as a Weeping Angel, and all of the angels around her. We hang here for a bit. And that's the, um, that's the, that's the cliffhanger. Except there's a fake-out cliffhanger. This is Doctor Who's first fake-out cliffhanger. Where's the music? Oh. Fake-out? Fake-out cliffhanger? Holy shit, it is. Doctor Who's first fake out cliffhanger. We have the viewer sound and we cut to the credits. Midway through, the, there's no music during the credits. Midway through it, it cuts to another scene where we see Vinder. I'm very happy to see Vinder and this guy from Bell's story. Uh, we're just going up to him and asking if he's seen Bell. He pulls up a hologram at Bell. The dude says that he's seen her because obviously he has. And then we get a nice little scene where um, I just really like this ending scene. Where the doctor, the doctor, uh, Vinder gets a message from Bell, a hologram message, saying where she's going. Uh, she's going to go defeat Azur, because uh, this whole prison thing that's going on with teleporting people. And uh, we get a nice exchange. It's a nice scene. I liked it a lot. I continue to be a sucker for these Bell and Vinder scenes. I can't help it. I think it's just really moving. I don't know why. I'm not usually a sucker for love stories, but it was good. I liked it. These two were surprisingly good. I really love you. I love you too. I'm on my way. My boy. Go get her. Okay, then we're back in the title. But that's the actual cliffhanger. We have this nice little scene where Vendor gets to kind of see Belle a little bit more closely. This is their first almost face to face they're missing each other by just a few hours and then you know we cut back to the rest of the title crawl and the credits uh, i guess in general i usually have some big you know 
poignant statement about the episodes and Ch Chris Chibnall at, at large. But with this one, I think the co-writer did a way better job at establishing characters, establishing a setting, establishing a threat, being consistent with this threat, and having a pretty serviceable episode. I'm assuming most of the serialized bits and the bad bits concerning the Doctor or the Leaping Angels were made by Chris Chibnall, because of course they were. Um, I think the weakest bits were probably the Peggy stuff in 1901. It felt really weird just to have this whole roundabout thing of there's an old Peggy. I feel like Peggy as a character was wasted in this one. Uh, I think this whole... Honestly, like, what happens in this episode? I suppose, and I already kind of said this earlier, I think this is just like an episode of Chibnall that does the least amount of awful things. And I think that just kind of artificially bumps it up a bit, in my opinion. I am a sucker for the Weeping Angels, as I said before. I have a huge tendency to just justify any dumb stuff that gets established with them because they're such a cool concept, and I never get enough of them. So I, I just, I don't know. I think I would maybe take my opinion here with a grain of salt. I honestly don't know what people think of this one. I think most of the stuff, how it follows with the Weeping Angels, executed well, executed faithfully, and expanded on in some cases with this whole image of an angel thing. I felt like that was very surprising to see because I hadn't really seen that. You know, the carefulness with, you know, watching images and being very careful surrounding that. I felt like those scenes were very well done. Jericho was very good. I enjoyed him a lot in the back half. I think most of the Doctor's lines were improved, except for the ones that were written by Chris. And I think the setting was a win for me. Um, most stuff, I think, is just... I think it's just kind of a filler episode. But it's all right, I guess. It's I don't think this one's going to tear out any hairs for you, aside from maybe the Weeping Angel Division stuff. But other than that, not really a lot to say. I'm really surprised I was able to get an hour out of this one. Uh, but yeah, that's my review of Village of the Angels. It was an all right episode, I guess. I didn't have too many problems with it. Uh, it was a good watch, and it's pretty much where that begins and ends. Which is very exciting to say, because, you know, we don't... We that a lot with Chris Chibnall. It's pretty much every single episode. It's like, all right, here's a dictionary of every single bad thing that happened. I have a feeling most people like this one, so I won't go on and on about it. Uh, thank you for watching. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Next week, I'll be back for Survivors of the Flux, which is probably our big, you know, penultimate episode where we get all the twists and stuff. That's going to be a real joy to review, I'm, I'm sure. That's when all the dumb stuff and uh, Timeless Child-esque revelations are going to occur. I'm sure of it, but, you know, we'll see when we get there. Uh, until then, I'm out. It's been a joy, as I've already said. And, uh, yeah, bye.